Hello and welcome to Lamplighter. Today is November 28. Over the last several days in our daily Bible reading, we've been reading about Paul and his missionary journeys to various parts of the world spreading the gospel. One of the places that we saw in yesterday's reading that Paul had traveled was the city of Thessalonica. And now, inserted into this part of our daily Bible, since it is in chronological order, we have Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, his first letter to the Thessalonians, that we'll read together today. In the, with the backdrop of some of the problems that Paul had had in Thessalonica with those Jews who were stirring up and causing riots that caused Paul and others to have to eventually go to Athens and other places, Paul writes this letter to the faithful Christians, those who had, obe who had obediently responded to the message in Thessalonica. And so I want to begin by just pointing out some things in the gray commentary section at the beginning of today's reading. At some point, Paul has sent Timothy back to Thessalonica in order to establish more fully the Thessalonians' faith and to exhort them to steadfastness in the face of persecution. Paul's letter takes on this same purpose. He also answers questions which have, been, which have arisen in their minds regarding the second coming of Christ. As a basis for his many exhortations, Paul begins his letter by referring to Timothy, Silas, and himself as examples of sacrifice and suffering. You see, these people in Thessalonica know that Paul has suffered for the sake of the gospel. They know that when he left to go to Athens, he left Timothy with them to encourage them and strengthen them during some very difficult and challenging times. So after Paul's greeting, introducing himself and Silas and Timothy as the authors of the letter, he also then begins to thank them for their faith. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. So here he's he's writing the letter himself, but he's including Silas and Timothy in this greeting. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great formula for Christian living, isn't it? Could that be said of us? that we have work that's produced by our faith, that we have labor that is prompted by our love, and that we have endurance that is inspired by our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great formula for Christian living. He says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And as a result of this, he says, your faith in God has become known everywhere, not just in Thessalonica. He says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And he's going to talk more about the second coming of Jesus near the end of the letter. He says, with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. We speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God. He is the one who tests our hearts, Paul says. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. And now watch how he describes their behavior among the Thessalonians. We were gentle among you, he says, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you, notice this one, as a father, deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. He uses the analogy both of a mother caring for and loving her children and a father instructing and guiding his children to describe his and Silas's and Timothy's role among these Thessalonian Christians. And as a result, they were eagerly accepted and appreciated. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So Paul is commending them. 
He has a longing to be with them, has great affection for them. And then he reminds them of Timothy's mission, that Timothy was to stay there and to continue to teach. And so Paul, not being there in person at the time of this writing, is anxious to hear from Timothy. And it appears at the time of the writing that he has heard from Timothy. And the report about Thessalonica from Timothy is a very positive one. And so Paul is very thankful. He says, now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. That's exactly what Paul wanted to hear. So he prays for them this prayer. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with his holy ones. I want you to continue to do what you're doing. Be strong in the Lord. Love each other. Love everyone around you. Show them the spirit of Jesus Christ. Great words of encouragement from Paul. He then exhorts them pretty personally to purity and chastity. He says, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact, you are living. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. You see, his call to purity is one that's bigger even than the individual. This is a calling for what it means to be Christ in the world. He goes on to continue to exhort them to grow in their love. He says, you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you brothers to do so more and more. Let that love continue to grow and flourish. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Live in such a way that people notice, he says. Let it be an encouragement. Let it be an influence on those around you. Let them see the spirit of Jesus. Thessalonians, the first letter to the Thessalonians, is a very practical letter even for us as Christians today. Then Paul begins to talk about the coming resurrection. He says, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Some were starting to ask questions about the end of times. When should they expect Jesus to come again? And so Paul is trying to say, let's not grieve when people die the way others do. We have a hope of a life beyond this one. And he goes on in the next section to say, it's like a thief in the night. We're not going to know when the Lord is coming. We just need to constantly be ready. And then he closes the letter with some great exhortations, among which I love this one. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Sometimes people ask me, how do I know what God's will is? This is a great answer right here at the end of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians when he says, three things are the will of God. Rejoice always, pray continuously, and in everything give thanks, no matter what the circumstances. And Paul then encourages them to keep on doing what they're doing, to live a faithful Christian life so that God will smile and others will see Jesus. Isn't it great to be a lamplighter? His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I hope you have a blessed day.